Hello everybody, welcome to my Summer Observing Challenge on my YouTube channel. Hopefully you've been following what I've been doing. Um, so uh, here's a few challenges for the summer for you to look out for. We got used to the seeing Venus in the evening sky, it's like a little friend, really bright sitting over in the west, but it's now gone. It's gone really close to the sun, within a quarter of a degree of the limb of the sun, so really difficult to capture. We got really used to seeing Venus in the evening sky, like a friend hanging over there in the west after sunset. But it got gradually closer and closer to the sun, as you may have seen in my previous uh, YouTube video. And we could watch it change as it went. Of course, it was going in between us and the sun, or just nearly passing within a, a quarter of a degree of the limb of the sun. So we couldn't see it at, conjun at inferior conjunction. But here's a number of images I took of it over the weeks. And uh, luckily during the lockdown, we had some really clear skies. So I was able to get out when I was able to, and it was clear and sunny to get out there during the afternoon and take some pictures. So here it is on the 14th. And you'll see as I took my pictures over the coming weeks, how much bigger Venus became. It also became thinner and thinner as a crescent. So as the distance between Earth and Venus decreased, it got bigger and bigger in the view. And you can see as it got closer and closer to the sun. And as you can see, as it got closer and closer to the sun, it got thinner and thinner. Of course, once it got really close to the sun, it was much more difficult to see. And you'll see, I managed to get it right up until May the 29th. And then it got really, really tricky because it's so close to the sun, if you use proper filtration like you do close to the sun, you wouldn't be able to see Venus. So I had to be really careful not to fry my camera and make sure that I stayed within the safe limits that I'd set myself. But I gave it a go. And right up until the 1st of June, it was actually at conjunction on the 3rd of June. So I was getting really close and it was only within a few degrees of the sun by this time. But I wanted to stretch my limits a little bit but really, really stay safe. Of course, it comes with the usual warnings. Please do not try this at home unless you know what you're doing. So let's have a look. Two days before inferior conjunction on the 1st of June, this was my view through the telescope. So you can see the crescent of Venus, very, very thin. And you see all these dust bunnies, which are dust in the field on the camera blocking the field of view and creating little shadows. So that was a bit of a nightmare. So I did try and clean that up. But you can also see if you look carefully, the atmosphere really wobbling uh, as Venus was there and all these bright spots passing through the field of view. But surprisingly, from that video, I managed to get that image out of there. So that's two days before inferior conjunction. So I was really pleased with that. But I wanted to get a little bit closer to the sun and a little bit thinner because these cusps go further round. So this was my view on the 2nd of June, day before inferior conjunction. So this was really the closest I was going to uh, try. Here it is, Venus is in that field of view. This is a wider view than we got in there. And you can see the glow of the sun on the edge of the field of the camera. And you can see all these bright spots flowing across the view. Of course, that's pollen and seeds in the atmosphere being lit up by the sun because you're so close to it. But uh, I failed to find Venus, so therefore I gave up at that point because I wasn't going to find it um, while it was in that configuration and the sky was way too bright for me to find it with my equipment. But I had a go. My next chance was on the 5th of June, which is two days after inferior conjunction. So I decided to try again and point my camera to see whether or not I could catch it. And here's the view that I got once it's zoomed in. You can see Venus really, really nicely crescent. You can see I've tried to clean the camera, but it's an absolute nightmare getting rid of every single bit of dust. And you can see some of these little white flecks still going through the field of view. But you can see how far those cusps are really extended now. But surprisingly, from that image, 
I managed to get this. So here it is, just two days after inferior conjunction, just 0.1% illuminated by the sun. So we see in the dark side of Venus, it's just over three degrees from the sun after it had come out the other side. And you can really see that these extensions are coming round. I like to think it goes all the way round, but uh, I think that's wishful thinking on my part. But it shows you what can be produced with fairly simple equipment, uh, but just a bit of know-how and being really, really careful. So this video is all about throwing out a challenge to you folks. Of course, the sun's always a challenge. Uh, don't forget to use proper viewing. This is a view of space weather today. And it shows the very few sunspots that we get. This is active region 12765. They don't usually put the one on at the moment. And this is a view from spaceweather.com. And this is a white light view that you would get just using a Bada film or a Herschel wedge, where you view the photosphere or the light sphere of the sun. They say we just passed solar minimum, so we're getting very, very few sunspots at the moment. But this active region 2765 is there at the moment. It's just gone past the middle of the sun. So we've got another four or five days before it reaches the limb of the sun and starts to disappear. Also on here, you can just about see up here, there's some bright faculae. And these are normally associated with active regions or sunspots. Uh, so I guess when 2765 gets back near the limb, we shall see quite a number of extensive faculae surrounding that sunspot because they're much easier to see on the edge of the limb where it's much darker. But again, please use proper filtration to make sure that you don't damage your eyesight or your equipment. Of course, if you've got hydrogen alpha equipment, you can see the chromosphere or the color sphere of the sun. So here's a couple of images I took last week and you see this lovely prominence sticking out from the limb of the sun and lovely detail along the edge here as well. And this one just over a week ago was a filament, but it was also coming round onto the disc of the sun as well. So it's what we call a filament and a prominence, so we call it a filiprom. So it's a combination of the two because prominences and filaments are one and the same thing. And associated with the sunspot on there at the moment is a very nice filament uh, seen extended from the spot outward, but I've not had a clear sky to be able to get out and image that since it appeared. So first challenge is get out and see if you can look at the sun using the proper filtration. Of course, noctilucent cloud season is upon us. In the last week or so, we have had noctilucent cloud seen from the UK. This is one that was visible a couple of years ago. And this is my view, just as the uh, storm or the clouds are actually fading. Uh, this was taken from my home just down the road. Uh, I was actually out imaging that particular night. And when I went up to put the card in the computer up in the study, which got a north facing window, I could see these clouds shining really, really brightly. So but by the time I dashed out with the camera and got to a place where I could see it properly, they'd started to fade again. So I had very quickly set it up. It's not quite in focus, but look out for noctilucent clouds. And they should be visible now until the end of August if we get some. Now, the best way to look for those, if you look after sunset, about an hour, an hour and a half after sunset, if they're visible, you will see them over in the northwest because they're actually lit up by the sun. These are very high in the atmosphere of the sun. Uh, they look bluey, pearly, white clouds with lots of structure in them. As the night goes on, what they will do as the earth rotates and the sun is below a different part of the horizon, and it's not during this time of year, it's not that far below the horizon the clouds are actually seen towards the north. So around midnight, look north and you should see them there if there's a display. But by the time we get to the morning sky and sunrise is getting imminent, you should be able to see them over in the northeast. So they follow the sun. So if you want to look for pollution clouds, have a look in those positions and see if you can see them. So there have been some the last week, so we are on for a display by the looks of it. Okay, the other thing to look out for if you've got a telescope is a supernova. 
in galaxy, the spiral galaxy M61 or Messier 61 in Virgo. This was an image I took on the 13th of May through my telescope. And you can see the galaxy really nicely with the spiral arms and lots of structure in there. But one of those stars superimposed on it is actually part of the galaxy. The others are actually part of their Milky Way, so they're much nearer. And here's the star, I've indicated the uh, supernova. So we're seeing a single star in that galaxy, really, really bright as it's exploded. And when I took this picture, it was about 14th magnitude. I've had a look and it's now about 15th magnitude. So it's still, you should still be able to capture it. So if you've got a set up for astrophotography, see if you can capture that supernova. We're gonna talk about comets. Now they are always a challenge. So Comet Atlas, that is dead, Jim. It has died. It was hopefully going to give us a really nice display, but it's gone. We can't, we're not going to be able to see that at all. Here's an image of it taken a few weeks ago. I was really battling the twilight and it getting really low. And you can see the green fuzz of the comet and you can see it's broken up into lots of different bits. So I've tried to invert this to show up some of the detail. You can see the bright spot that was active at the time with a little tail pointing up. You see this dust cloud streaming away from it, which was the tail as it was developing nicely. And you see this cloud of particles at the front, which are all the fragments that it broke up into. So don't go out looking for that because you're not going to see much. There are people who have captured this cloud, um, but it is really, really difficult. It's now low in the western sky once it gets dark. So uh, really difficult to capture that. The Comet Swan, we were hoping that was going to give us a good display as well to replace Comet Atlas. But as soon as it started to be visible from the Northern Hemisphere, it decided to die as well. So we were denied that one too. Then another Comet Atlas, 2019 Y1, that's actually in Ursa Major at the moment. So that's visible uh, if you know where to look. And I'll show you a map of that in a moment. Also Comet Pan stars 2017 T2. That's also in Ursa Major. And again, I'll show you a map of that in a moment. And that's actually an outburst. So it's brightened quite rapidly over the past few weeks. And then Comet 2020 F3 Neowise. That's in Orion at the moment, so it's not visible, but it is heading north. Again, I'll show you a map of that in a moment. And then there's Comet 2019 U6 Lemon. And that's in the Southern Hemisphere in Puppis, um, just to the east of Canis Major. But it is headed north. Again, I'll show you a map of that in a second. So let's have a look at Comet 2019 Y1 Atlas. And you can see at the moment, it's up here, and then it's traveling southeast in this direction. So here's Coma Berenices. So these are the Coma Berenices galaxies, and this is Coma Berenices itself, and here's the Black Eye Galaxy Messier 64. So you can see it's going to travel below those clusters of galaxies, and then it's going to go into the Virgo cluster as well. So it's going to pass by a number of the Messier galaxies within Virgo. So that's something to look out for, but that's not going to be until July. Here's C2017 T2 pan stars, and you can see up here, it's actually within the bowl of the plough. It's an outburst, so it's actually brightened really, really quickly over the past week or two. So here's the left-hand two stars of the bowl of the plough, and it's heading southeast past Canis Venatici and then into Coma Berenices, but it's north of the main cluster of galaxies around Coma Berenices. And so around mid-July, this is where the comet is going to be. So it's moving fairly rapidly in that direction. How bright is it going to get? We really don't know. But as it's an outburst, it may just outburst and then fade again, or it may continue to outburst. That's unpredictable comets. Comet Neowise 2020 F3 is about magnitude 8. It's currently in Orion here, not far from Betelgeuse. Here's Betelgeuse, but it's going to swing its way up and around. It's going to go through Lynx, 
here, which it will do by mid-July. And then by the end of July, it's below the plow. Here's the seven stars of the plow and the rest of Ursa Major. So it's going to cross below the southern part of Ursa Major by the end of July. And then it goes into Coma Brennesis after that as well. So a lot of comet action around Coma Brennesis over the next few months. The next comet is Comet Lemon. That's in Pupis, and it's about magnitude six and a half. So it's almost on the uh, naked eye visibility. And you can see down here, in uh, here it is at the moment, and it's going to work its way north. It's going to go through Hydra here, and then up below Leo. Here's Leo. Here's the sickle of Leo, and here's the body of Leo. And it's going to continue off through the Virgo cluster here quite nicely and pass a number of messy objects. And that's going to be around, this is the middle of July here, just below the tail of Leo. And then by the end of July, it's passed through the Virgo cluster and carrying on. And by the middle of August, it's right by Arcturus, the very bright yellow star. Okay, another challenge I'm going to throw out to you is Barnard Star. That's in the constellation of a Fucus. Now, Fucus is a really nice constellation because there's lots and lots of globular clusters for you to enjoy down there. Now, Barnard Star is a red star. That doesn't make it particularly interesting. It's at magnitude plus 9.5. So it's fairly easy for most of us with small telescopes. But it's got a very fast proper motion. So it moves really, really quickly. And that speed is about 10.29 arc seconds per year. So it's actually quite fast. So within our lifetime, we can see the motion of the star fairly easily. And that so it moves about one degree every 351 years. And at some point, they were talking about possibly five planets going around it, but that seems to have uh, dropped from discussion at the moment. So maybe it isn't moving as they expected with these wobbles or perturbations in its motion uh, caused by these planets. It's gone very quiet on that uh, front at the moment. So here's a picture I took a while ago. And you can see Barnard Star is actually this one here. And the way to find it, there's this lovely little triangle of stars here, just below it. Don't confuse it with the wider triangle of stars, which is here, which can confuse things if you're looking on the wrong scale. But this little triangle here is the one that indicates where it is. Because if you find that and come a bright star here, one, two, and this is Barnard star here. And here's that picture that I took back in June 2012. So here's that little triangle of star. And if you've got Burnham Celestial Handbook, this is the position that it was marked for July 1960. In my observing manual, I actually drew this area and I noticed that Barnard star was actually here in June 1996. So that's where I drew it some years ago. So when I took this picture in June, 2012, you can see that Barnard star has moved from the position that I drew it a few years ago. What I really need to do is to go back and take another picture. Perhaps I'll do that this year. That'd be another little challenge for me. And then superimpose the picture on top of the other one and see the movement. Luckily, I have friends that have done that already. Nick Hewitt has given me a picture he took fairly recently. I think it was taken last year. I'm not 100% sure. I need to check with him. And when I superimposed the two images together and made an animation out of them, you can see that when you shift between the two pictures, you can see the little triangle here. And then I'm around here and you can see Barnard star flicking backwards and forwards between the two positions. Just over seven years. So anybody with a small telescope and a camera can actually take images and see that motion of the star. So that's another challenge for you. On the 13th of June, the moon's going to be close to Mars in the morning sky. And then the 14th of June, the moon will be a little bit further over, but actually Mars is very close to Neptune that particular morning. 
easy to find Mars because it's fairly bright, fairly red. But Neptune is a little bit harder. Here it is, here, much, much more difficult to see. Magnitude plus 7.89, so a lot, lot fainter than Mars. It'll be nice to get a wide angle view of Neptune and Mars and see if we can get the both in the same field of view in, in an image. Another event that's going to happen on the 19th of June is the moon's actually going to go in front of Venus in the morning sky. What's it going to look like? Well, this is a couple of images that I took of the moon and Venus on the 25th of May, and I've put them together to show the relative sizes of the two objects or the apparent sizes of the two objects. Obviously, here, here's the moon. You can see Mari Crisium quite nicely here the lunar sea and then down here is Venus and I've superimposed them to show roughly the size of the two objects as we see them from Earth and you see that Venus is much brighter than the moon is so what's it going to look like well about 8 36 in the morning here's the moon you can see the very thin crescent and you can see Venus very close to it here so the ingress, the bit where the moon covers up Venus, is going to be easy to view an image because you can see Venus, you can see the crescent of the moon. But the dark area here, you're not going to be able to view in the bright morning sky. I said Venus is going to be much brighter than the moon, so you're going to be able to view that very nicely and it should be easily visible. And the moon should help you find it in the telescope. And then just before the ingress of the crescent starts, you should see it very close to the moon's limb. You're not going to see this bit because you're not going to see the dark side of Venus either. So you're only going to see the effect when the crescent starts to disappear behind the limb of the moon. And then by 8.41 in the morning, Venus has nearly gone. It'll be, you'll have a nice little hook coming out of the uh, limb of the moon there and then it'll be gone so once venus is gone you're only going to see the crescent you're not going to see this dark side it'll be brightly lit up by earth shine but because the sky is going to be go so bright we're not going to be able to see the dark side so here's the big challenge the occultation lasts just over an hour and the egress the bit where venus emerges from behind the moon on the opposite side of the crescent is about 944. But that's going to be much harder to view an image unless you're using a really wide angle view. Because how do you know where Venus is going to emerge from? It's going to be difficult because you haven't got a term of reference here. You're not going to see the lovely Earth shine on the moon because the sky is going to be so bright you're not going to be able to see it you'll only be able to see the crescent of the moon and try and judge where venus is going to appear from so that's the track it's going to make it's going to travel across and it's going to appear out the other side so i suppose if you sort of go halfway round, then you might be able to get your telescope in the right spot to see a detailed view of it appearing so there it is, just appearing, and that's about 9.44, and then about 9.46, about two minutes, it takes to actually come from behind the moon's limb. So that'll be a great challenge. As the summer solstice approaches on the 20th, the sun is at its highest in the sky. And if you take a picture of the sun, very short exposure, and you get an image of the sun in the frame and you take a picture of the same setting throughout the year you get the track that the sun takes throughout its journey in our sky so it's about here at the moment and it's on the 20th of june it'll be here and then you'll see it coming down 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 until in winter midwinter it's going to be here so if you take a number of pictures throughout the year you can reveal this lovely figure of eight that the sun makes in its journey in our sky due to the tilt of the earth and the uh, motion of 
the Earth around its orbit. It travels fastest during the winter, which is why this loop is bigger, and slow in the summer, which is why this loop is smaller. And I've been challenging myself to do that. So here's the result so far. So this has started at the end of December, and you can see this big gap here where we had lots and lots of horrible weather. This was taken about a week ago when we had some nice sun. So I'm hoping to capture that little loop up here and then the big loop going down. So that's my attempt so far. So that's an ongoing challenge that I've set myself for this year. So it's going to take me until at least February, the end of March next year to fill in the gap that I missed this year. On the 9th of July, Venus is actually right within the Hyades star cluster. So this is in the morning sky. It's really, really low down. Here's the Hyades. So it's Venus, Aldebaran, the red eye of the ball, of course, lovely red star, and the V-shaped Hyades there as well. And then above those, a little bit higher up in a bit darker sky, is the Pleiades star cluster. Of course, this is nothing like the view we had of Venus when it passed through the Pleiades earlier this year so here's the three days that it passed and you can see the 2nd of april that's where venus was in the evening sky on the 3rd of april it was right by the cluster and then on the 4th of april it had just gone past the cluster and having three nights in a row to be able to attempt that shot was uh, amazing to get and it's really strange the different evenings produce different colored venuses depending on the colour of the twilight when the images were taken. A bit further forward, on 14th of July, Jupiter reaches opposition. It's visible in the south at midnight and the biggest and best. And of course, just to the left of it, you also got Saturn as well. It's low down in Sagittarius. And here's a little bit of a closer view. So it's showing some of the moons. This is one o'clock in the morning. Here's Jupiter, Io, Europa, and Callisto. The other bright stars are actually stars. They're not moons. So Ganymede is missing. You have to wait a little while for it to actually appear because it's actually behind Jupiter at that particular time. So that'd be quite nice to go out on the night of opposition and have a look and watch Ganymede appear from behind Jupiter's disk. And of course, not far from uh, Jupiter is Pluto. That's our opposition on the 15th, uh, but that's much, much fainter at magnitude 14. And it's amongst the stars of Sagittarius. And if we enhance the stars in that area of the sky, you can see just how many stars there are. So New Horizons is looking for a new target and it's heading off in that direction of the Milky Way. So it's trying to find a new Kuiper Belt object to explore now it's done Pluto and Arakoth. Uh, so it has to look at moving stars amongst all these hundreds of thousands of stars that it can see beyond in our Milky Way. Here's a bit of a closer view. There's Jupiter up here. And this is the position of Pluto compared to Jupiter. And of course, Jupiter moves much, much quicker than Pluto does. Here's Pluto's path. And you can see this is where it was in January. It's done a little bit of progress. And then as the Earth catches up with it and overtakes it, it does this retrograde loop. And this is where it is at opposition. And as the Earth keeps overtaking it, eventually it'll do a little loop and then back again. So that's the whole travel for a year. But because Jupiter moves much, much quicker than Pluto, it's actually overtaking it three times this year. So you can see this is it in forward motion. So in March, it passed Pluto. But it was then, they were then, we couldn't see them in the evening sky. And then Jupiter stops and does a retrograde loop, just like Pluto does. And then in July, we actually see it pass Pluto again. So it could be quite nice, a nice challenge for you to try and capture Jupiter with its moons and Pluto in the same field of view. And then of course the next time in November it actually passes again, but this time they're going to be very close 
uh, down in the twilight, so uh, it might be a little bit more difficult to capture that. And imaging Pluto. Here's my image of Pluto. Impressed, eh? No, there's not really much to see because it just looks like a pixel, a bright pixel in the image. And what you have to do, you have to take two images on successive nights, and then when you put those together, you might be able to see Pluto moving in the image. Now the two images are this one here and this one here. And you can see on successive images, it's jumped backwards and forwards between those two positions. So that's my view of Pluto. Of course, it's nothing from the view that uh, New Horizons got when it went past. So here's Pluto, so an absolutely beautiful disc. And you can see this lovely heart-shaped Tombaugh Regio area and of course Sharon as well which is much darker than Pluto and it's got this lovely uh, red cap on the top as well but of course the view that does it for me is to look back with the sun behind Pluto and you can see this beautiful blue atmosphere as new horizons raced away from it okay last few challenges to go 19th of July Mercury is going to be visible really really low down in the morning sky it's magnitude plus 0.6, so it's actually fairly bright, but the bright twilight will prevent you from seeing it really, really well, because the angle of the ecliptic is quite low at that time of year. So therefore, despite the fact it's away from the sun quite a bit, it doesn't really get very high before the sun rises. So Venus is there to help guide you. Of course, you've got the Hyades. By this time, Venus has moved out of the uh, Hyades. And there's the Pleiades as well. But to help you find Mercury, you're going to have a very thin crescent moon, very low in the northeast. And you see it's really, really thin crescent. So that's going to be a challenge in itself to find. But if you can find the moon, that will help you find very, very low below it is Mercury. A very, very tiny dot, but you do need a very good northeastern horizon to be able to find it. 20th of July, Saturn is at opposition. Of course, we've got Jupiter and we've got Saturn in the south, both at their best around this time of the year. And then a few days either side of Saturn coming to oppositions, the rings get much brighter because there's less shadows on the individual particles that make up the rings. And this is known as the sea liger effect. So see if you can see those rings brightening as it approaches opposition. Here's a picture I took in April showing the rings and showing uh, Saturn. And you can see the angle of the rings as they are then. But if you look at one of the images that I took in 2018, when it was a little bit higher up, so I could, could get a little bit of a better image, you can see that the rings are starting to close up. So the rings, as they close up, will get less and less impressive as time goes by. So get out there and have a look this year to make sure you see the rings at their best. And the other thing to look out for, but that's much, much later in the year, Jupiter is gradually approaching Saturn. On the 22nd of July, Mercury reaches greatest western elongation. But again, because of the angle of the ecliptic, it's not going to get very far above the horizon. So here's Venus and here's Mercury, really still very low down. But on the 22nd of July, you're not going to have the moon pointing it out. So uh, you're going to have to hunt around, but make sure you don't hunt around before the sun. Uh, make sure you do all your hunting before the sun comes up. Otherwise, you could possibly damage your eyesight with the sun above the horizon. And of course, 12th or 13th of August, we've got the maximum of the Perseid meteor shower. And they come from this region of sky over here, just above Perseus, very close to Camelopardalis. And if you see a meteor and draw the line back, and it points to that spot, you can almost be sure it's a Perseid meteor. If you see another one and the line takes you off in a different direction, that's just a sporadic meteor and not part of the meteor shower. And of course, the challenge with meteors is to capture them on film. You need a very high ISO. You don't have to have the camera driven, but if you do, you will 
uh, not have star trails in your pictures, but star trails can look very nice in meteors as well. But have a very high ISO because the meteors travel so fast, even though they're quite bright, they do take time to record on the film. So the higher the ISO you have, the more chance you've got of recording a meteor on your camera. So they're active actually between the 17th of July and the 24th of August. So there's plenty of time to capture a meteor, not just on the 12th and 13th of August, but they are at maximum on those particular days. And they reckon there's going to be about 85 plus per hour, but that's a really good rate. And because uh, the radiant's not that high, you're not going to get as many as that. So there might be 50 or 60 per hour, I would guess. On the 14th of September is a nice conjunction of the Moon, Venus and the open cluster Pricepi, Messier 44, and that's in the dawn sky, so here they are. And if we look a little bit closer, here's Venus, here's the Moon, which would, should show a very, very nice Earth shine as well, and the cluster here. So that could make a really, really nice wide angle picture uh, showing the cluster, showing Jupiter, and showing the lovely crescent moon with earth shine as well. So there's another nice challenge for you. So looking ahead, the opposition of Mars is occurring this year. So this is where Mars is at the moment, but it's actually traveling a little bit further north and it's going to actually come into the constellation of Pisces. It does a retrograde loop and it comes to opposition about here. And then once it's past opposition, it travels in the retrograde motion and then switches round and then passes across the ribbon of Pisces again and it passes this cluster of galaxies and onwards to the end of the year. So oppositions on the 13th of October. Here it is in the southern sky on that date. So you can see it's much higher than it was when it was at opposition a couple of years ago. It's magnitude minus 2.6, so it should look very, very bright and very, very red by this time in our sky. That's in Pisces, as I mentioned. So here's the opposition last year, uh, two years ago, and you can see that it was quite a big disk at that point. Although this opposition isn't a perihelic opposition where it's closest to the Earth, it's actually not that much smaller. So you can see this is the day of opposition. So you see it's a little bit smaller, but not that much. But because us in the Northern Hemisphere, it's a bit higher, we should be able to get a better view than we did back in 2018. Of course, they had a major dust storm on Mars that year. So even the Southern Hemisphere observers didn't get really good views of the surface. So hopefully it's our turn this year. But here's the challenge. The challenge starts now. Here's an image that I took of Mars on the 7th of April. And you can see just how small it is. You can see a little phase there, and you can see just how it's changed since January. So this is January, February, March, April. So that's about when I took this picture. You can see the phase quite nicely. You can't see any surface features. It's a bit rubbish because it was very low in the sky, uh, but I had a go. Anyway, as the year progresses, it's going to get bigger. So May and June, you can see just how much it's grown in the last couple of months. And I really ought to get myself up early and get out there and take some more images, see if I can improve on that, and I'm sure I can. It's a little bit higher in the sky now, as well as being a bit bigger. So when you come to July, you can see just how much it's changing. It's getting much, much bigger in our sky. By August, it's quite big. And in September and October, it really does change. So look at how big it gets in October. And then of course, as we get to November and December, it starts to shrink quite rapidly. And uh, so our best observing time is now over. So it's really from September to November is your best observing and imaging time for Mars. But get out there before, challenge yourself, see how small you can get Mars and see if you can resolve some surface detail on Mars when it's really small. But don't observe Mars at the same time on successive nights. 
it's quite easy to say, oh, I'll get up tomorrow and have a look at Mars because I'll see a different part of the surface. Of course, that doesn't happen with Mars because its rotation period is very similar to the Earth's. If you went out the next night, you would more or less see almost the same view as you had the night before. So if you get a good, clear run, one evening, make the most of it. Stay out observing Mars and watch as the new features rotate into view. And even if you've got imaging capabilities, take a number of images and produce an animation of it rotating before your very eyes. Another challenge for you. And then looking a little bit further ahead, Jupiter and Saturn are going to be very close together. And that's going to be the 21st of December. So a little Christmas present for you. It's going to be low in the southwest. And if you look in the southwest at that time, you see a really, really bright star sitting down in the twilight. And this view is about 4.34. And there's Jupiter. But very close to it is Saturn. So they're so close together, they almost appear as a single star. So if we zoom in on that a little bit, this is the view you'll get through a telescope. So here's Jupiter. So they're visible in a wide field of view, but actually not that wide a field of view. So you see some of the moons as well as Jupiter and Saturn. So there's Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. This is actually a bright star in the same field of view. Although these are going to be a real challenge in the twilight. And then, of course, there's Titan as well, the brightest moon of Saturn, which may well be visible. So I think there's plenty of uh, scope there for you to challenge yourself this coming summer. So despite it being summer, lots to enjoy and quite a few challenges along the way. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you want to know what's happening up in the sky, my skydive is available on Team Up. So go to the www.star-gazing.co.uk forward slash sky hyphen diary and you can download the app and carry the sky diary around with you as well so you don't have to be online or on the web to access it friend me on facebook and so you can follow what i've been up to follow me on twitter and of course on youtube as well and all my images i put on Flickr as well so have a look on there to uh, see what i've been up to I'm running the Virtual Astronomy Club, uh, keeping astronomy social, especially during the lockdown, but I do intend for it to continue after lockdown finishes. So go to the website wwwstar gazingcouk forward slash virtual hyphen astro hyphen club. And um, hopefully we'll see you online very, very soon. And just a cheeky plug for my astrophotography guides. I do some astrophotography guides to help you with your astro imaging i do one on deep sky stacker one on photoshop and also one on imaging the moon using the webcam and dslr and my new book affinity photo astrophotography image processing is available as well and that's proven to be very popular as it's so cheap at the moment and then talking about affinity photo I'm running an Affinity Photo Virtual Astrophotography Image Processing Workshop, and that's going to be on the 27th of June between 10 o'clock and midday. So I'll take you through some of the tools and how they're used to process astrophotography images. So there's my summer observing challenges. I hope you've enjoyed them. Follow me on social media and YouTube, and hopefully get out observing. <laughs>